good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Donna Rice, the Chief Operations Officer for Diabetes Sisters. And as you know, Diabetes Sisters is the only 501c3 dedicated to women with diabetes. We offer an evidence-based peer support model that provides comprehensive education and monthly peer support groups. Our expert series webinars are designed to provide the most updated information and education by experts in the field. So please, if you have a question before during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A and we'll address them after the talk. Today's webinar is on insulin and sponsored by Sanofi. It's titled, Unlocking the Role of Insulin, the Key to Glucose Management. Our speaker is no stranger to the diabetes arena, Davida Kruger. Davida has been a certified nurse practitioner in diabetes at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan for more than 40 years. She earned her master's of science in nursing degree from Wayne State University in Detroit and her bachelor of science in nursing from Boston College. Her role includes both clinical practice and research and she is board certified in both primary care and advanced diabetes management. Davida has been a principal investigator and co-investigator on numerous studies of diabetes interventions and care, including the National Institute of Health-funded multi-center EDIC and ACCORD trials. She lecture, lectures extensively throughout the U.S. on maximizing outcomes in diabetes and diabetes management. She's the past chair of the American Diabetes Association's Research Foundation and has served on the ADA Research Policy Committee. She is also an ADA past president of healthcare and education. She has published more than 100 abstracts, articles, and chapters on diabetes management and authored the 2006 second edition of the Diabetes Travel Guide. She also has served as edit editor-in-chief of two American Diabetes Association journals, the Diabetes Spectrum and Clinical Diabetes. Her awards are many, including the Florence Nightingale Award for Excellence in Research, ADA's Rashmiel Levine Award for Outstanding Service in Diabetes Research, as well as numerous awards for the Outstanding Educator in Diabetes and Nursing Excellence. Please help me welcome Davida Kruger. Well, thank you, Donna, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It really is my pleasure to be here. Um, Donna already said that I have been in the world of diabetes for more than 40 years, and sometimes I can't even believe that. But just as a background, I want to tell you that I was hired to do the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial in 1982. Back then, all we had was mixed beef pork insulin. We did not have blood glucose monitors, although we got them to start the study. A1Cs just came into being for research, not for clinical practice. Um, and insulin pumps were about this big, and I am not exaggerating. The insulin had to be diluted and the pump had to be plugged in at night to charge. So we really, really, and we didn't have anything like GLP-1s and SGLT2 inhibitors. We had sulfonylureas that caused lots of hypoglycemia. So um, I'm really excited to talk to you about the changes that we've seen and I know so, you, you all know a lot of it, but I'm going to focus today on insulin. So I, I also want to say that we need to talk a little bit more about type 2 diabetes management. And we have to say that back in the day when I first started, we didn't think type 2 diabetes was a serious disease. We said, oh, that, that's not a serious disease. People can be sweet. And that's what we called it. And why? Because we didn't have anything to offer. As I mentioned already, we had sulfonylureas. They were long acting. They caused a lot of hypoglycemia. They caused a lot of weight gain. Both my mother and my grandmother had type 2 diabetes. So I knew this firsthand. And also um, when they needed insulin, which was short, which was soon because we didn't have anything, it was one injection a day if lucky. And that's how we were treating type 1 diabetes as well. And it was a mixed beef pork insulin. And of course, um, we were doing urine testing at the best and we were looking for the, what we call the color blue um, in, because if we had the color blue in the urine, that means there was no glucose. Little did we all know that that just meant for that small period of time. 
But what we know now is that type 2 diabetes is a very serious disease. And what we do in the first year of management is huge. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side of my slide is what we call the legacy effect or metabolic memory. We see that in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And what we now know is that in the first year after diagnosis, if the A1C is greater than or equal to 6.5%, um, it's associated with a 20% higher risk for microvascular and macrovascular events. So that patient we see or that person we see whose A1C is seven and a half or 8%, we're like, eh, that's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. And we have the tools to make it not okay. And then 29% higher risk of mortality is associated with A1C seven, uh, seven to less than 8% compared to an A1C of less than 6.5%. And then on the right-hand side, um, immediate intensive therapy, 25% treatment uh, reduction of microvascular disease with early intensive therapy was seen in UK PDS. And then post-trial re risk reduction emerged in the MI far, M MIs and death from any cause and the legacy effect of 44 years. So what does that mean? When we look at the data, from the UK PDS, which did intensive therapy when they met those individuals, not only did they get a benefit from right then and there, but that benefit has lasted more than 40 years. So on the left-hand side, if I can see that patient early on and make a difference early on, the body remembers what we do. It's, it's true in the DCCT for type 1 diabetes. It's true in UK PDS for type 2 diabetes. So we want to be aggressive. We want to be assertive. We want to provide the best care we can and get those A1C to treatment goal. And if we do it long enough, the body will remember there's periods of time when it's not as good. Okay. So this is the thing that I think is really frustrated. This data goes up to 2020, which is only a couple years ago. Um, and you would think with all of the medications on the market that we were doing better. This is NHANES data. It looks at U.S. adults age 18 and greater with diabetes from about 2017 to 2020. And on the left-hand side, it's the percentage of patients at each level of A1C. So 53% had A1Cs of less than 7%. That means greater than 50% of those individuals had A1Cs greater than 7%. 23%, um, 77.9%. Um, 11%, 8 to 9%, and 13% greater than 9 On the right-hand side is a percentage of patients with A1Cs greater than 10% by age group. So the orange, 46%, I guess they're all orange, but the lighter orange, 46%, 18 to 44 uh, Darker orange is 42%, 45 to 64 and greater than 65 12%. Where's the greatest increase of people um, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in the United States, those individuals over 65 years old. Um, so those individuals we need to focus on as well to help them make sure we get their diabetes under better control. And then um, the perspective on insulin, it's um, acceptability of insulin is low among patients with type 2 diabetes. And you know, my feeling is it's low because we're not presenting it correctly. And often it's used as a weapon instead of like the, the this is where we're gonna start. Um, this is most likely where we're gonna end up. Of course, in type one diabetes, from the day you meet those individuals, you're gonna give them insulin. But for type two diabetes, we have other therapies that we're gonna start with. And so we have to say it's a continuum of care. And that we know 70 or 80% of individuals with type 2 diabetes, ultimately, some time in their career of diabetes, will need insulin. So the acceptability of insulin is low among patients with type 2 diabetes. They may not be getting the support. They may not be getting the education. They may not be able to get the help to get prior authorizations. It may be affordability. But it's leading to reluctance to initiate and continue insulin therapy. But when I meet a patient, I say, this is what we're going to do today, and this is what the plan is long term. A large proportion of patients interrupt or discontinue treatment shortly after initiation. Why? They may not have been gotten, given the education to understand. This is what you're going to feel. You might have hypoglycemia. We may need to adjust other things. Um, if your A1C is 9 or 10%, 
and we bring that A1C down to 7% on just insulin, not if we have a GLP-1 on background, but on just insulin, people will gain weight. And that's why today we start most people on a GLP-1 and or an SGLT-2 inhibitor, and then we add insulin to help with and blunt that weight gain. Um, and then um, 74 million Americans use one or more form of insulin to manage their diabetes, 7.4 million. And 20% of the patients initiating basal insulin continue with insulin treatment within the year after initiation. That means all 80% of those individuals, we start on insulin, stop it. I actually was working on um, our in-basket. We have Epic and someone sent me a message and said, can you please work with this patient? Um, we put him on insulin. He takes himself off. And, and some of that I may not be able to accomplish a better outcome, but I'm hoping if I talk to that person and explain why insulin was ordered, um, the best way to take it, that it's not a bad thing because you're starting insulin, but that we're trying to prevent complications. So well, some of the barriers, uh, the perceived significance of needing insulin and the potential complexity of a program. And I'll talk to you about how we want to start it. Um, you know, if people think that it's a punishment or they've been bad or they're not doing the right thing, they don't want insulin. Instead of saying, um, you know, this is part of what we need to use for for your um, diabetes. And they believe that they have the bad diabetes instead of um, this is what we expect with diabetes. Myths about complications related. I hear that all the time. You know, my aunt Sally went blind. Uncle Joe lost his foot. Well, if we had started insulin earlier, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Fear of injections, pain, hypoglycemia. I think um, because we use GLP-1s first in type 2 diabetes, patients are often taking an injection, so I think that helps us. Um, and then concerns about weight gain and costs are certainly issues. So what is this? This is a physiological insulin release in someone who does not have diabetes. Um, and so what you're seeing is that if I, if I don't have diabetes, um, I have my own kind of basal background insulin that keeps in between meals, keeps my blood glucose as a nice steady state. And then when I eat and the blood sugars spike up, you can see that in this individual, the insulin, and that's what those peaks are, the insulin is automatically given through the body, through the pancreas to keep the blood sugars normalized. So this isn't glucose levels, this is insulin levels. And so every time the patient eats, they get insulin, so their blood sugars do not rise. Okay, so what does the American Diabetes Association say about insulin? Insulin, you should be considered, when you meet that person, we used to say basal, 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 as soon as you meet that individual, and we're not saying that anymore. If the patient has type 2 diabetes, a person with diabetes has, di has type 2 diabetes, uh, when you meet them, offer them a GLP-1. Why? Because that will help get them their A1Cs down without hypoglycemia and with, without weight gain, except... If you meet that individual and the A1C is greater than 10%, blood sugars are greater than or equal to 300, or the patient A1C is greater than 9% and symptomatic, those individuals should go right on insulin. Now, you can then add a GLP-1 to them later, but we want to start the basal insulin, get the diabetes under control, and then we can backtrack and see about other therapies. If the A1C is 9%, you could start with the GLP-1, and if that's not enough, you can add insulin. All right. This is just a caricature, and I want to say it's a caricature because I'm going to go through all of the other insulins that show you the onset, peak, and duration, and yeah, this is what they tell us in science, but it's not always the case, but what I want you to walk away to see is that the purple is your rapid-acting insulins, your Lyspro, Aspar, Glucine, your um, green is the short-acting insulin, the human regular insulin, the purple are analog insulins. Uh, the blue is, um, again, human insulin, NPH, and there's a place in our lives for NPH, uh, less, less now than even five or six years ago. And then long-acting analog, Detamir, which is actually um, stopped making it in 2024, I think, or end of 2023, December 2023, but it's still on the market, so that's why I left it here. And then long-acting analog insulin, Glargine, and then uh, long-acting analog insulins, U300 and Degladec. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. And I put this up because I wanted you to see the weekly insulin. 
So the rest of what I already showed you. And you may be aware that um, Novo is the first company that's trying to bring um, weekly insulin to market. And they just kind of got a stop point. Um, the FDA approved their type two weekly, but not their type one weekly. And if I'm not seeing, I don't think they're going to bring either to market yet. But know that it's out there and it's a very in interesting insulin and there will be, Lily's going to bring one to market as well. It's called Icodec and literally you take it once a week. Now the dosing is higher um, because you only take it once a week, but it has a flat pharmacokinetic profile, reduced variability, reduced um, burden injection. Now think about that. You could be taking a once weekly GLP-1 and a once weekly insulin. That's kind of cool for our patients um, if you think about the burden of diabetes. And it is a big burden in terms of um, blood glucose monitoring or CGM, uh, multiple daily injections, other medications, other comorbids, um, hypertension, elevated lipids, uh, thyroid disease, all of the things that um, uh, people with diabetes deal with on a daily basis. So here's a little more. Again, um, this isn't tried and true. It's just a start point. And why do I say it's not tried and true? Because um, I think they lie. No, I think that this is what the pharmacokinetics look like when you're looking in a lab or you're doing research. But when you hand it to a person with diabetes, everyone, the person sitting in front of me is different, every single one of them. So NPH and it is humulin or novolin. And then rely on insulin is from Walmart. And if patients can't afford their insulin, rely on insulin is really good because I think depending on the day, the place, it's about $20, $25 for a vial or a, a, a month's supply. And sometimes that's cheaper than a copay. But for NPH, and when would you use NPH? Typically, we use it with patients who are on steroids injection because of the way it peaks onset and duration goes away quicker. Um, sometimes we use it in pregnancy um, or sometimes when we just can't hit the mark and getting um, glucose is under control, but usually it's my patients on steroids. Onset is one to two hours, peak is four to eight hours, duration is six to 12. So if you're really gonna use NPH, um, most individuals will need it twice a day, unless if I'm giving them steroids in the morning, and they take NPH in the morning, it peaks around the same time as the steroid and is gone when the steroid is causing hyperglycemia. So it tends to be really helpful for those individuals. Uh, Lantus or Baziglar, onset is one to four hours. They say no peak, there is some peak. They say it lasts 24 hours. It really only lasts 18 hours. And so if you take it in the morning um, and then... Um, Overnight, you have high blood sugars. It's probably because it's running out. Or if you take it at night and then in the early evening, you have higher blood sugars, it's probably because it's running out of its most of its power. And then Denimir, as I ind ind indicated, is not being made anymore. Um, it's still out there on the market. Probably sometime in 2025, the market will run out. But really to get coverage, it's for twice a day. And it could be used in pregnancy, vials or pens. And then 2JO is either 2JO or U300. And the U300 um, isn't like U500, meaning you don't have to worry about how to dose it. It just means there's more in the pen for the individual. And they still take, if you're moving them from a U100 insulin to a U300, the dosing is the same. It's just a little, um, the, the volume is smaller. And so um, they can get more in a pen. Onset is in about six hours, no peak, 24 hours. It does last 24 hours. I want to put your, fa your, your eyes to the onset because a lot of times um, a, a, a patient of mine will say, well, my blood sugar is great at bedtime. So I didn't take the Lantus, the Determere, the Glargine, whatever. But understand that most of these are not designed for what's happening at that moment at bedtime or when you're taking the injection because they have an onset and a peak and duration that's later on. And if a patient says, oh, my blood sugar looks great at bed, so I'm not gonna take my insulin, then for the next 24 hours, they have problems with their glucoses. So make sure everyone understands, you all understand that, um, 
you still need to take it even if it's a great blood sugar at bed and we're great that it's a great blood sugar. Then Degladec U100 and U200 or Traceba onset one hour, no peak, and it's got a 42 hours. It's probably a little bit less than 42 hours, but it gives the patient um, the Glargine, the 2J and the Traceba are probably the best choices for our patients um, because of the duration for them. They truly get 24 hour coverage and that's what we're looking for. And then the rapid acting insulins. Um, again, Humulin um, and Novolin and rely on insulin, the rely on, these are regular, they're human insulin, not analog insulin. And the molecule is like what the person with diabetes is not making, but the analog insulin is better for the person um, to use uh, in, in terms of how it operates in the body. So the regular insulins, you have to take 30 to 45 minutes beforehand, and that's really hard. Peaks in two to four hours, it's long acting, four to eight hours. And that's another problem because it can cause hypoglycemia. But again, if the cost is the insulin is an issue, rely on insulin at Walmart. Novolog, Apidra, and Humalog. Um, I'm going to say this, but I'm just going to say this because this is what happens, is they tend to be interchangeable. Now, having said that, I will tell you that the people I see in my own clinical practice will tell me Novolog does not act like Humalog in my body, and I believe that. However, what happens with the insurance companies is they'll say, you know, they got a better price of Novolog, so now we're using Novolog, and next year we're going to use Humalog. But they should, for the majority of the people, be interchangeable, onset in 15 minutes, peak one to two hours, duration two to four hours. So they're in the body and out of the body. So now if you use a longer acting basal insulin and you use something like a sh uh, an analog mealtime insulin and take it 10 to 15 minutes before the meal um, and you get a peak in one to two hours and it's gone in four hours, Remember the first slide I showed you with the, um, how the physiology of the body's insulin, now we're trying to mimic the body's insulin. Okay, I just put this up to remind you that whether you have a person has type one or type two diabetes, hypoglycemia occurs and 11% of individuals with type two diabetes reported greater than or equal to severe, one episode of severe hypoglycemia, that means someone had to help them. Once I prescribe insulin, I also pres prescribe some kind of glucagon, whether it's um, an inhaled, an injectable, a pen, whatever the insurance will allow, that's what I prescribe. The other thing is, it is hypoglycemia is not dependent on the A1C. So you can see 14% hypoglycemia with A1C is greater than or equal to 9% versus 12% hypoglycemia, A1C is less than 6%. Now, the A1C of greater than or equal to 9% may be because that person is having a lot of hypoglycemia. And so they're omitting their insulin because of the hypoglycemia, which gives them the higher A1C. So then I have to go in and investigate and find out. And the best way for me to investigate is to use continuous glucose monitoring because I can find hypoglycemia that even the patient doesn't know exists. But um, don't minimize hypoglycemia. We know it exists. Okay. Uh, best practices when starting basal, fix the fasting first, share decision-making of what the A1C and the goal of the A1C should be. That is between um, the person with diabetes and the healthcare provider in a perfect world. Um, we're using insulin. We should be using continuous glucose monitoring and get the A1C less than 7%. Uh, discuss corresponding fasting glucose goals and focus on AM glucose. If a person says to me, I'm not comfortable if my blood sugar is not at least 140, that's a place we're going to start. I am not going to push them because I don't go home with them at night, which is a really good thing for my patients and for me. Um, and, um, I, you know, it, even if I say, oh, no, no, we're going to do 100, uh, that person's decision, it's their decision, it's their diabetes. And then use a weight-based dose. There's no right or wrong way to start a basal insulin. And I have to tell you that for most people, I just start either 10 or 20, 20 units because it's easy for the patient to remember and it's a start point. But you can do 0.23 to 0.3 units per kilogram starting dose of the long-acting analog, 0.1 before breakfast and dinner, bedtime if it's NPH. Um, just pick a dose and use it. There's no wrong way. 
And then the big thing is that once you pick it titrated, and again, there's no, there's no way I do what's not scary. So I, I look at data and I'll say to the person with diabetes, I'd like to increase your uh, basal insulin by two units. Is that comfortable for you? And if the person says, yes, that's what we do. If I say, oh my goodness, the blood sugars are still 300. I'd like to do four units. And the patient hypo person with diabetes hypoventilates, what is comfortable for you? That is exactly what we're going to do. But what you don't want to have happen is we started at 10 to 20. We never see the patient again. And the patient is, that's a reason to stop insulin. I give you 20 units. The blood sugars are still running 300. Nobody's gotten back to you in six weeks time. You're still worth running 300 because nobody's adjusted the insulin. Why am I taking this injection? So we really want to make sure that we adjust the insulin. Then set parameters when to stop titrating because we don't want to go over the top with the basal insulin. At some point, that person needs mealtime insulin. So when you reach about a half a unit per kilogram of body weight, that's enough basal insulin. Always keep uh, assessing it. Make sure that the AM blood sugar looks good and that um, they're not having hypoglycemia. Um, and look at this, look at the fasting. So you want to look at what the blood sugar is at bed and what the fasting is, and that's called BEAM, B-E-A-M. Um, and so you want to make sure that the um, th they haven't dropped too much and that you're making a difference. And then basal insulin dose, if, if you get up to seven units per 0 0.2, 0 0.7 units per kilogram, um, you don't get any benefit in terms of lowering the blood sugar. So once you get to 0 0.5, it's time to think about mealtime insulin. And if this patient is not yet on a GLP-1, it's time to add the GLP-1. Okay, so once we get to <clears throat> um, fasting blood sugar where it needs to be, we're gonna start looking at the pre and post meals uh, before the meal and uh, two hours after the meal to see if we need to start a mealtime insulin. And if you are considering insulin, start with a basal, um, after you're gonna, if you're gonna start um, adding a mealtime insulin, start with basal plus one. So pick the next meal that is the biggest meal and the blood sugars are the highest. The patient says, you know, my dinner is the highest and look at that number, that's where I'm gonna start the mealtime insulin. And I'm gonna start it with 0 0.1 unit per kilogram. And again, usually I do somewhere between four and 10 units, depending on what the blood sugar is and what the A1C is and with the comfort level of the person with diabetes. And then of course we have to look at cost, weight gain and hypoglycemia. Um, and then definitely if the patient's not on GLP-1 and they have type two diabetes, we really wanna get that person. There's so many benefits. GLP-1 doesn't cause hypoglycemia, has weight reduction, has cardiovascular and kidney benefit. All of those things are really important. And you know what? Almost every insurance company will cover it uh, with great results. Um, this is the American Diabetes uh, Association standard of care, and it just basically says use a continuous glucose monitoring for all people with diabetes. I think of it as, um, you know, a uh, it's not a privilege, it's a benefit, and that person, it's a right. If you have diabetes and you're on insulin, it's a right. Even if you're not on insulin, I think CGM is a right, not a privilege, and we should be offering it to all people, especially once they get to one injection of insulin, they should have CGM. It also makes my life a little bit easier. Then there's um, other things that help. There's smart front pens. I'm gonna show you the, some of the other devices. And so let me just show you. Here's our, if you haven't seen some of the pens out there, obviously the syringes, inhaled insulin is coming up, um, is, is a, a good option for patients with good coverage. On the left-hand side is Vigo. That gives the patient a basal rate and bolus insulin over 24 hours. On the right is Secure Simplicity. It's for the mealtime insulin only, can be worn for four days now, two unit increments. And then here's um, insulin pump CGM. Uh, there's a huge explosion in the market and the, all, all of the insulin pumps talk directly to the CGM um, and so that it doses insulin for the person with diabetes. The outcomes are phenomenal. I manage about 2000 people on insulin pumps today. So all this is very exciting. If, um, you know, it's never a good time to have diabetes, but it's about the best time with everything that we have for people with diabetes. So. Thank you so much for listening. I could have talked for about another hour, but um, Donna said I got 30 minutes. So here I am. Thank you. Thank you, Davida.
Tavita, if you could take your slides off screen share, that would be great. And we are going to open it up for questions from our audience. So the first question comes from an, an anonymous sender. It says, I find that my blood sugar varies depending on where I inject my insulin. Why does this happen? And Thanks. is it safe to inject if only in my abdomen? Okay, thank you, thank you. I should have had that in my slides. I'm so glad you asked that. So what happens over time, if you keep injecting in the same spot, is you get scar tissue. If you, it's called lipohypertrophy. If you run your hands over any area that you're concerned about, you'll actually feel that. You may not see it, but you may feel it. And actually you should be, and sometimes you can actually see it. Um, I mean, I have people let me look at their sites and I'm like, oh, there, there, there. Um, and so those become very comfortable for you, but you don't get good absorption. So you want to avoid those sites. You don't want to use them for a minimum of six months. You want to go to new sites that you've never used and you want to let those sites rest. And the other thing is, if you've been injecting into a bad site or one that has lipohypertrophy and now you use a good site, you may in fact need less insulin. So go away from that. Yes, you can use your abdomen if you're going around and using every aspect of your abdomen, but try to use more sites. You can use lower back, upper upper tushy, you can use arms, but you know, if you run your, your hand over a site and it's bad. The other thing is if you have sites that aren't good, you can put your CGM in them because CGM is pulling out, not pushing in, but move on to a new site. Very good. Okay. Our next question comes from a Deborah. I seem to have a problem with my blood sugars between 12 and 3 p.m. where it goes high up to 300s and I'm always hungry during that time of day. Any suggestions on how to deal with this? I am on a T-Slim pump. Oh, well, if you're on a T-Slim pump, that's great because you, two hours before your blood sugars start to rise, you get, you have a higher basal rate. And then um, two hours before when they start going down. So if it's 12 to three, 10 to one or two, have your basal rates increased. And I do it smidgy. Again, smidgy. I, she's not telling us if she has type one or type two diabetes. Both can use a pump. But um, if I go like, um, if let me say your basal rate was 0. 0.5, then I would do 0. 0.525 for that extra time and then just gently increase it. And then look at your insulin to carb ratio and your correction factor, um, because it may be that your insulin to carb ratio and correction factor is not good for that particular meal. And I'm going to assume it's lunchtime. Make sure you take your mealtime bolus 10 to 15 minutes before the meal, and that should help it. But with a T-Slim, you absolutely can target where the problem is. Very good. This is similar. Why does insulin make me so hungry? I'm so frustrated. Any help? You know what? It's the higher blood sugars that make you hungry, not the insulin per se. And they're usually um, correlated. The other thing is you may just be hungry because you're missing GLP-1. And in people who have type 2 diabetes, we can give that back. In people who have type 1 diabetes, unless you have coverage for weight loss medications, we can't put it back. And so that's some of it as well. But the hunger is often related to a higher blood sugar. And the next question is, taking insulin is an art. It has taken me years to get it right. I am premenopausal and I notice my sugars are higher and they do not come down like they did before with insulin pre with an insulin pre-meal dose. Any tips? Oh my gosh, She's, you hit that nail on the head because I always say insulin dosing is an art, not a science. And that's from us as healthcare providers and for people with diabetes. And I have to depend on you or I do depend on you to make some of the final decisions on what we're doing with dosing because you know your body better than anyone. And I, you know, I know the book knowledge and then I try to apply it to the person in front of me. But premenopause and postmenopause, all of those have hormonal changes that affect um, what's happening with your insulin. So you may need um, different settings or different dosings because of the hormone surges that you're getting. And hopefully that will settle down at some point when you're past menopause. Very good. 
Thank you, Davida. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. We're about out of time. So I just want to thank you again, Davida, for a wonderful presentation and a big thanks to our sponsor, Sanofi. And to complement Davida's talk, we have two great tip sheets that's available for download. One is on insulin in that chart. And I know somebody said that they were having some trouble reading the chart on their computer. So it is available for download. And we also have a tip sheet on hypoglycemia. And we know Anybody on insulin, like Davida said, should know how to do any kind of rescue for hypoglycemia. So we have that available for you as well. Again, a big thank you, Davida, and our sponsor, Sanofi. And thank you all for joining. Bye, everyone.